Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you my review of the new X-Mount version of Tamron's 11 to 20 millimeter. This is an F2.8 DI3A RXD. I'll break down quickly what that means. It's 11 to 20 millimeter that is designed for mirrorless, in this case specifically for APS-C mount, which of course is Fuji's X-Mount, and it has their RXD focus motor. A maximum aperture of F2.8 throughout the zoom range of 11 to 20 millimeters which takes you from this to this, giving you a lot of different framing options. Now, it was last year in 2022 that Fuji really started to open up their platform, and we have seen a host of third-party development come, which to me is a really, really great development for Fuji because it makes it much more attractive as an alternative to go. And as they up their game in releasing ever better cameras, including those like the one that I'm using now, which is the X-H2, it is a really exciting time to see these third-party lenses coming to the platform right at the time when Fuji has really upped their game in terms of the cameras that you can mount those lenses on. So Tamron has started to release some of their recent E-mount lenses onto Fuji X-mount. And I've been interested in looking at them and I will be reviewing some of them over the next few months. But I've been interested in basically two things. I want to see how that they handle the transition to Fuji's autofocus, which of course is different in kind from, uh, from Sony's. And there has been some distinctions that I've seen in the past. But then also the maximum resolution that Sony has had, at least to this point on their APS-C platforms has been 24 megapixels. I did review of the 11 to 20 millimeter in 2021. I reviewed the 11, 20, 11 to 20 millimeter on uh, a Sony A6400. And so you get one result obviously at 24 megapixels, but now of course Fuji has really upped their game to a 40, resol 40 megapixel resolution point on bodies like the X-H2 or the X-T5. That creates a whole different standard of, of demand on lenses for performance. So I was interested in seeing how this handles that transition as well. So we'll break all of these things down right after a word from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Into the AM, a clothing brand from Southern California that wants to outfit your passion, whatever it might be. Their everyday comfortable fabrics and designs are great whether you are working from home, working out, or even just chilling out. I love the fit and fabric on their everyday t-shirts, and you can choose more funky styles created in collaboration with local artists like this killer Fractured King hoodie. Use the code DUSTIN10 or follow the link in the description to get 10% off site-wide, including their monthly t-shirt club. Visit intotheam.com forward slash DUSTIN10 for more information. So obviously, as Tamron transitions into a whole new platform and a new market, the competition is different. In this case, there really isn't a lot of wide-angle zooms that are currently available on uh, Fuji's X-Mount platform. The primary ones are from Fuji, and they include a 10 to 24 millimeter f/4 OIS, and then the more dramatic 8 to 16 millimeter f/2.8. Obviously, there is a pretty significant difference in pricing with the latter. They're a little closer on this former. The Tamron is the cheapest at $829. The 10 to 24 millimeters is $1,000, whereas the 8 to, 8 to 16 millimeter is $1,500. So a pretty big you know, spectrum there. And just to give you kind of a, a kind of the strengths and weaknesses of each, each lens in a nutshell, the 10 to 24 millimeter has a maximum aperture of f4 compared to f2.8. It does have an optical image stabilization in the lens itself. Some would argue these days with more and more Fuji bodies having in-body image stabilization. Maybe that's less of a factor than what it used to be. However, the image quality, at least on paper, does not compare to what the Tamron does, the Tamron being stronger. The 8 to 16 millimeter f2.8, which I have reviewed, is a very good lens, but it is very large and heavy. And obviously it is not quite twice as expensive, but fairly close to it. And it is over twice as heavy. So it's large, it's heavy. It's a more extreme instrument that obviously goes to a much wider uh, focal length. And so not everyone needs or wants that wider focal length. And you'll have to determine that for yourself. So Tamron has the smallest zoom range, 11 to 20 millimeters. Obviously that's you know, it's not even a two times zoom range, but it also has the smallest size, it has the lowest weight, and it has the lowest price tag, while also having some of the pro features you're looking for, like a large maximum aperture of f2.8 and weather sealing. 
So how large is it? Well, as you can see here, it is a relatively compact lens that on a body, larger body like the X-H2 is an easy fit, but I've also shot in this review on the new X-S20, and it also is a fine fit there. It is 73 millimeters in diameter or 2.9 inches. It is 86 millimeters in length, 3.4 inches, and it weighs in at 335 grams or 11.8 ounces. One of the nice things about Tamron's design on mirrorless is that they have adopted a 67 millimeter front filter thread as a standard for nearly all of their lenses. Only the more extreme optical instruments have something outside of that. So as a byproduct, their 67 millimeter filter thread is number one, a very common one, but also if you have multiple Tamron lenses, it's really easy to share filters across them. So one kind of uh, advantage there. Now, Tamron's design, uh, they're carrying their kind of basic design philosophy basically right across from Sony E-mount to Fuji X-mount. That's fine, except for the fact that the standard is a little bit higher on Fuji X-mount in terms of build quality in general. And then also, most all Fuji lenses do come with at least an aperture ring. So that is missing on this. And obviously, there are no other switches on the lens. There's no AF-MF switch, which isn't necessarily common on Fuji. So that may not be missed. But not having the aperture ring is going to be one disadvantage to those that are accustomed to reaching for that as Fuji, Fuji X-mount sh shooters. The lens itself then just has two things on the barrel. And the first of those is the broader zoom ring. And there is a little bit of a barrel extension, not far, it's about an inch, um, you know, two and a half centimeters or so. And uh, that extension comes actually at the, the 11 millimeter rather than the 20 millimeter position. So kind of a reverse zoom in terms of the extension. And so the fully retract position being at 20 millimeters, the furthest extension point being at 11 millimeters. The only other thing here is a zoom ring, which is okay. It's There's nothing exceptional about it. The feel is okay. Uh, it's not gritty or anything, but it doesn't have a whole lot of feel to it. And so it's not an extraordinary manual focus experience. Now, as noted, it does have a quality weather sealing, starting with a gasket at the lens mount and a total of seven seal points throughout the lens. That's obviously going to be very welcome for, particularly with wide angle lenses, you're gonna shoot in adverse conditions sometimes and having that weather sealing does help to give you some reassurance. There are seven rounded aperture blades inside that produce a pretty decent sunburst effect when the lens is stopped down. This lens has a, a variable minimum focus distance. So on the wide end, 11 millimeters, you can get as close as 15 centimeters and as high as a 0.25 times magnification. And then at the telephoto end, it, the minimum focus distance extends to 24 centimeters, giving you a 0.13 times magnification. In some ways, I still prefer the telephoto end because it's uh, you don't have to get right on top of your subject to actually take that photo. By the time you measure from the sensor to the front of the lens, there's not even hardly room to keep your lens hood on the lens. And so I, I prefer the telephoto end or somewhere in between, as we'll see in our image quality breakdown. So overall, when it comes to build and hand, handling, there's nothing fancy here to point to, but at the same time, the design language is clean. I've had lenses like this for years. They've held up just fine. And so I think that the build quality is going to work, even if it isn't anything mind-blowing as far as features or adding something new to the equation. Autofocus comes via uh, Tamron's RXD, which stands for Rapid Extra Silent Stepping Drive. Uh, it's a fancy word for a good quality stepping motor here. And so autofocus is fast and smooth for, for stills. And um, there's basically no sound involved during focus. Focus changes are nice and snappy. This isn't a particularly challenging lens as far as the, uh, the aperture and focal length combination. And so I had zero issues with autofocus for stills. I found good precision in tracking eyes, be it a human eye, and then also in the sequence in tracking Nala's eye as I watched on screen and took photos. As I moved the camera to different positions and she roamed and did her thing. Uh, it kept a good constant tracking there. And so I was able to get good results on that. Things are a little less rosy, however, on the video focus front. So when it comes to video focus pulls, you can see that there is at least one visible step there where you get about 90% of the focus travel, a very brief pause, and then it completes the focus. No real settling at that point, but there definitely is that stepping that takes place. I also did note a, that it did a little bit better with my hand test and that the focus transition back to my eye was smoother. I didn't see that stepping, and so it seems like it's a little bit more confident when it 
it has something to track, like an eye, because the you know the AI learning in some of these recent cameras, it really likes it better when there is a tangible subject that it can track and keep focus on. I found that focus transitions at wide apertures, like in these shots where I'm kind of gliding from one focus point to another, I felt like it did pretty good. There's no abrupt feeling to the transitions, no pulsing or hunting there. And so that was the positive side, but I did see a little bit of hunting at smaller apertures in some situations, either a backlit scene like with these leaves, but I also saw it when shooting over a, a canyon and there was a lot of potential focus points and it seemed like it would be more confident if I went to a smaller focus area and just kind of focused on, kind of told, told it where to focus and so that it didn't pulse some back and forth. So autofocus, good for the most part, and certainly for stills, pretty much perfect. But for video, I, could, I see room for a little bit of improvement there, maybe as uh, Tamron learns Fuji's focus algorithms, possibly firmware updates in the future might help that, but obviously I can't predict what will come in the future. So how about the image quality? That leads me to my kind of my second major point. And I wanted to know, can a lens like this handle such a high resolution point? And it's not just the absolute resolution point. Obviously there are cameras of different types that go higher than 40 megapixels. But on APS-C with that smaller sensor, 40 megapixels is a ton of pixels to pack in there. And in many ways, this is the most demanding sensor that I have tested anything on. Definitely more demanding than Sony's 60 megapixel uh, full frame sensor. It's more demanding than Fuji's own medium format, 100 megapixel sensor. As far as the pixel density, this is the highest density that I've tested on. So can this lens hold up to it? Let's dive in, let's take a look. So first of all, let's take a look at the zoom range that is here. At 11 millimeters, you can see this is from a tripod framing the room. And then at 20 millimeters, you can see that there definitely is some significantly different framing options. Now, I will say that they show up more in a smaller space like this than, say, a landscape type setting. Um, but at the same time, obviously, you're going to have a lot of important focal lengths for wide angle, angle work that are all represented in this particular range. Everything from around 16 and a half millimeters full frame equivalent up to about 30 millimeters full frame equivalent. Now we can see if we take a look at the vignette and distortion that there is a mild amount of barrel distortion there and a bit of vignette, neither one is overly significant. I made the correction here by using a plus nine and then vignetting a plus 79 uh, to get things completely lighter in the corners. Now, interestingly, I didn't have to use that much vignette correction on the Sony platform. And so I'm not quite sure where that discrepancy comes from because the lenses should be the same optically. But anyway, you're not going to have a major issue with either one. This is a JPEG of that same shot out of camera, so it shows that uh, Tamron is getting full correction profile support in Fuji, which is great to see. And so as a byproduct for your video and JPEGs, they will be corrected if you enable it in camera. And then, of course, you're going to have to deal with RAWs separately in post. I did not see any really apparent uh, longitudinal chromatic aberrations. You can see in this shot with lots of areas where there's transition and places for fringing and then going towards the specular highlights in the background. Really not any kind of fringing to see there. So those are well controlled, no problem there. Now there is a bit of lateral chromatic aberration as you can see. It doesn't show up a whole lot at 100% magnification. At 200% it shows up more, so obviously not a major issue. And this is the kind you can correct with one click. And as you can see here on the right, what bit of fringing is there is cleared up very easily with the one click. And so not going to be a significant issue either. So of course the significant challenge that I was interested in seeing if this lens could handle would be to handle the very high resolution and very great pixel density. Like if a sensor like the Fuji's X-H2 40 megapixel sensor, which I am testing on here, and this is at 200% magnification, this really is about as steep a test as what any lens has to face right now in terms of the demands of the actual sensor it's put on. So as you can see in the center of the frame, 11 millimeters f2.8, no problem. It holds up really well there. We can also see that the mid frame, while not as good as the center, is really not bad at 11 millimeters. And if we look down into the corners, you can see that it is not as sharp or high contrast there, but neither is it a mushy mess either. So overall, not too bad there, all things considered. Stopping down to F4, 
four, if we take a look in the center, we can see that there is a mild uptick for the center performance in terms of the sharpness and contrast. In the mid frame, we can see that it's again, it's a mild uptick. It is noticeable, but not significant. And down into the corner, corners don't really show a major improvement yet. We see a slight bit more improvement at f5.6, but still not significantly good. And at f8, we see what is probably our peak performance here, where while it's not as crisp, anywhere near as crisp as what you see in the center of the frame, the corners are starting to look fairly good. Now, if we take that into a real world shot, 11 millimeters f5.6, this at a more typical 100% magnification, we can see that there is good detail in the center of the frame. And as we pan here towards the side, the detail remains fairly good. It's not mind blowingly good, but you can see that off into the corners, the resolution is holding up even on that high resolution sensor. And we can see that it's drawing obviously well into the distance as well. And so um, overall, you know, it's obviously a very credible looking, good looking image that I'm able to capture there, even on that demanding high sensor. Now, minimum aperture is F16. You can see, however, that diffraction on it, particularly on a, such a high resolution sensor, diffraction is really going to take a hit. And that's going to be true everywhere you look. It's a little less apparent in the corners just because the lens is less sharp in the corners. But you can just see that contrast, every, all the textures are just a little bit mushy because of diffraction. Now, if we move to the middle of the range, this is 16 millimeters. We can see that wide open, the center of the frame is good, not quite as good as at 11 millimeters. However, we do see that it's better in the mid frame. It is also a little bit better in the corners. Uh, not like, again, not like pen sharp in the corners, but better. You can also see that there's less distortion to correct. And overall, we see a, a good image quality all across the frame, even here wide open at f2.8. Stopping down to f4 shows a significant improvement in the center of the frame. We see that similar improvement in the mid frame, which is looking really, really excellent. And we can also see that these corners are sharpening up already at f4, basically better than what we ever saw um, at 11 millimeters. By f5.6, they're looking really, really good. And if we move on to f8, we see that they look is slightly better still, but this at landscape apertures is going to deliver really good results all across the frame. Now, if I shoot at landscape apertures on a slightly less demanding sensor, this is on the new uh, XS20, which is a 26 megapixel sensor. You can see that our detail everywhere we look here is looking really, really good. So obviously that's going to be true on this in general and with any lens really that uh, just uh, such a demanding sensor is going to demand the very best out of the glass. And in this case, a slightly less demanding sensor makes the lens show off a little bit easier. Now, if we move on to 20 millimeters at the telephoto end, we can see the center of the frame continues to look really good. Mid frame is looking good. And if we look down into the corners, we can see that the corners are really uh, probably about as good as what we have seen thus far at f2.8. Now, if we stop down to f4, we see a significant improvement in the corners. And so already you're going to get really good results all across the frame. Um, shooting at f4, you can see the center of the frame has lots of punch. And everywhere that we look, we're seeing good performance on the f4 metric uh, showing up with very good resolution. From f4 to f5.6, we see that there's more in the tank here, and so we've got even better performance right into the corners. So this is obviously at 20 millimeters. If you shoot at smaller apertures, you're gonna get really, really good performance, even on the most demanding of sensors. Another real world example at just 100% magnification at a closer focus distance, you can see here that 20 millimeters f2.8, you can see a lot of really fine details. And of course, the advantage of such a high resolution sensor is you have the ability to go really deep in terms of magnification and just see a lot of detail there at a pixel level. So that's the advantage. It, I know it sounded negative because it is a demanding resolution point, but it also gives you this incredible deep cropping ability. Even on the X-H2, I was really impressed with a lot of images that I saw that even at a pixel level, the detail as I look at different places in the frame, it looks really, really good. And obviously viewed as a whole, colors look good, saturation levels are nice, contrast looks good. This is a lens that can perform on this demanding sensor. 
Now, I've already mentioned the maximum magnification level. One interesting little hack is if you shoot in the middle of the range, somewhere around 15, 16 millimeters, you're getting very high uh, performance in terms of the lens sharpness. But what you're also getting is the ability to get that really high magnification, but also to get it at a a little bit better working distance than at 11 millimeters, which pretty much requires you to be on top of your subject. And so you can see with this leaf, I've been able to fill a lot of the frame here um, by getting close, but not as close as what it would be required at 11 millimeters. And I like this result better. Here's 20 millimeters f2.8. And while that magnification level isn't as high, I like the ability to uh, just to have a little bit more of a defocused background and get a little more creamy looking background. I just like the overall framing and lack of distortion better when shooting at that. And so that's still my preference, even though it's at a lower magnification level. Now, the quality of the bokeh is actually fairly good for a wide angle zoom. I don't see a lot of outlining there. And so as we transition towards defocus, it looks nice. I thought that this lens worked quite well with some of like the Acros type uh, film simulations. And so you can see here that I like the colors. I also, or colors, it's, I, I like the tonality, I should say. And I also like the quality of the bokeh from the lens. This shot stood out to me as being a really nice one as well. You can see obviously really good detail and contrast. This is on the XS20, so a little bit lower resolution, but contrast and detail looks really great. And the quality of the bokeh, it's a little bit busy, but there's nothing that's, it's more the nature of the focal length. The actual quality of the blur is really quite nice. Colors look good, and I have enjoyed shooting this lens on Fuji, where there are some really great, obviously the film simulations, but also just good color science. And so I felt like images like this just had a really great look to them. Another shot here where I thought colors looked nice, and obviously the detail on the plane of focus, which is out here, looks really nice as well. Now, flare resistance was a bit of a mixed bag. Now, in many situations, it was quite good, particularly at large apertures. You can see here there's bright sun right in the frame, but contrast and detail is held up really well uh, in this shot with the sun just barely peeking into the frame and at a medium aperture of f5.6. No real ghosting artifacts. Things are looking quite good. In this shot, however, um, you can see that there is some flare artifacting down here, which I didn't see the same when I was composing in a horizontal position. So you really do have to watch a little bit with your composition because obviously there is a little bit of a flare pattern that is there. I do feel like the coatings maybe worked a little bit better on this Fuji version than back when I reviewed on the Sony version. I just didn't have as many issues there or here as I did there. You can see again, some little ghosting artifacts here, nothing that's terribly destructive to the image, however. Now, in this case, I actually reviewed the Fuji version right during the uh, Canadian wildfires, and so there was just no night sky to see during my review period. So I am recycling this from my Sony version of the lens review, but it did sh hold up well at that point. You can see that coma performance is quite good. There's just a little bit of stretching towards the end, but no real growing of wings. And you can see that star points look nice and crisp. This is a lens that will work just fine for shooting Astro, which gives it another area of strength. Overall, a pretty good performance considering the demands of Fuji's new 40 megapixel sensors. So in conclusion, I believe in the transition to Fuji, this remains an interesting option on the Fuji platform. On paper, it has better IQ than the 10 to 24 millimeter, though I haven't tested that lens yet. And I would say that it is roughly comparable to what I saw from the 8 to 16 millimeter in terms of performance. It is much smaller, however, and cheaper than that lens. And not everyone wants such an extreme lens to carry around. And so I think that it really kind of hits a sweet spot offering up that faster maximum aperture, including things like weather sealing, and also a very you know useful focal range for wide angle work. I would say that it probably excels most at having a great price to performance performance ratio, which frankly is the typical sweet spot for Tamron lenses. And it is the reason why I am so glad to see it on Fuji to provide just that. A lens that maybe isn't at the very top of the heap in terms of performance and features, but gives you, you know, 90 to 95% of what a first party lens might, but at a lower price point and a usually more compact size. And that's exactly what the Tamron 11 to 20 millimeter F2.8 RXD provides for Fuji X mount shooters. And for that reason, it is a very welcome addition to the platform. 
I'm Dustin Abbott. If you look in the description down below, you can find linkage to my full text review, also linkage to an image gallery there, some buying links if you'd like to purchase one for yourself. There's linkage there to follow myself or Craig on social media. You can become a patron. You can get channel merchandise. And of course, if you haven't already, please like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Have a great day and let the light in.